Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Future Space. I'm your host, Daniel Fox. Our guest today is Octave de Gaulle. In 2015, Octave co-founded Spade Agency, a design firm aspiring to find ideal forms that will allow us to really live in space, not just survive. Their first client was the champagne company GH Mum. In September of 2018, after three years of research, including several zero-g flights, Octave and his team unveiled their first creation, the Mum Grand Cordon Stellar, a bottle of champagne for space set to be served on privately owned space exploration company Axiom Space. The project was awarded several design prizes and is currently under further development with a, a French space agency, CNES. Octave is a permanent member of the Space Habitat Technical Committee at the International Astronautical Federation. Octave, welcome to the future space. Thank you, Daniel. I've been wanting to have this conversation. You're all about the human experience of going to space beyond the science and technology. So this really falls under the banner of the narrative that we're doing at Future Space. But before we get into all of the work and your journey and your vision, could you share with us, for you, what are three words that captures the essence of space? Yeah, thank you very much for having me on the podcast. Um, I would have to start with exploration, obviously. Um, we're talking a lot about space. Some people have difficulties also figuring out what's at stake, if we are going just to send billionaires, if we are having to send robots, if... What does it mean to go to space? And I, I really like to recenter the the idea around the exploratory uh, mission that we have in space, and because it, I think this captures exactly um, what's important, which is sending humans where they have not been. Um, we are not uh, solving an equation. We are actually wandering and trying to venture the unknown and maybe learn something either about ourselves or the the whole universe or where we come from or where we are where we are heading and this idea that we are not um simply ticking a box you know and that we are actually wandering in the unknown as many humans did before at sea at land you know and and if you if you look at the story of exploration and the story of discovery um this is a fantastic one this is the one that always gave a solution we couldn't foresee. And so the, the drive for me is really exploration and, and venturing in this unknown, which brings me to a possible second term that I like to add when talking about space, which is territory. Um, territory is, a, is an idea, literally it means land, so I'm, I'm happy about the, 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 this term because it's typically not land, but it also am, comes from, from the idea of um, of what surrounds uh, a city, what surrounds a place we know, you know, the territory is the is usually linked to some kind of governance, and and I like to think that um, exploring space, we are exploring a territory, you know, today it's the outskirts of Earth, tomorrow maybe the solar system, but as we um, enlarge our knowledge of that territory, uh, and as we consider this is not, there is no Earth on one side and space on another one, but this is all a big territory. Um, I think we capture the idea of exploration and of not separating what surrounds us from what we know into two different concepts. And obviously the third one for me will be culture, because as a designer, I started to, to work on space because of the cultural images that um, a lot of people have uh, of space and I was actually questioning these. I, I was not mesmerized by it. I was questioning why are we fascinated by Star Trek and 2001 Space Odyssey and why there is a culture of shapes that we associated with space. It's called Space Age. Um, and why we project onto space an ideal, sort of an ideal world, you know, in, in, a, in a way. Or, an, or, or, I mean, how do we how this projection uh, could be analyzed so that that was the the starting point of my journey as a space designer and then i i slowly looked at the difference between the 
the idea that we had of, of, of space and the construction in the culture that we have of space and what it is actually, if you look at the interior of a, of a space station, I often used to say it looks like the interior of a PC, you know, you, it's full of wires, it's really unhabitable and, and, and when you compare this ideal world, white, completely immaculate, where nothing uh, comes out of any drawer, you know, when everything seems to be at its place and this being what we project to be an ideal space, and the difference with the, the, the current one, I, I thought, I, I thought this, this cannot be that we as designers, we don't investigate that topic, you know. And investigating that topic led me to, to realize that we were, um, we were only solving problems that our brain was capable of, of comprehend. Um, and in a way that's normal because space is still young as an exploratory field. But we were we were constantly resolving an equation of functioning bodies, you know, like nutrition, sleep, efficiency. And we were not asking the big question, which is how do we remain human? How, what makes us human be, uh, uh, after that, or, or be, um, sorry about that, after the, uh, after that, after the survival, actually, what, what makes us human? You know, when you go camping for a couple of days, um, you figure out, it's a rough kind of living, but you always find yourself somewhere around the fire um, exchanging anecdotes. And, and the more you talk with astronauts, you realize that's sort of their experience, you know, and that there is a big question, which is um, what holds us together as human. And for me, this falls on, under the concept of culture, what I call human culture. Um, and so culture is sort of the alpha and the omega for me as a space designer. This is where I come from. Uh, and where we're heading uh, in my work or in my field. It's, um, it's an interesting. I think that often we look at, you know, what we've become as a society and, you know, technology has given us the ability and in fact kind of taken us away from the, the, the constraint of nature. Right? Back in the days where we didn't have the kind of technology, we were limited, we're basically all our needs were were solely concentrated on our uh, ability to survive right how to to bring the food how to create shelter how to defend ourselves and gradually our the technology that we invented and our capacity to go beyond these you know these needs allowed us to focus more on the human experience right how can we have comfort and I'm always interested in the history of design. The other day I was listening to a podcast and they were talking about how just the invention of a, of a chair, right? Back in the days, the, your, your fire was located in the center of your room. Like if you go into the old days of, uh, of, of Japan or oh, yeah, yeah. medieval, yeah, the, it was, it was, there was not even just a, uh, uh, against the wall. It was in the middle of the room and people would aggregate and people were sitting on the floor so the heat would kind of move around. But then when the, the, the fireplace was moved against the wall and then the heat would go up, and then sitting on the floor would be really cold so they invented the chair so that you could sit higher. Like all what we take for granted but how design is an intricate part of that experience. And, you know, you just mentioned nature, we go to nature. The vast majority of people enjoy nature because you can go and you can come back, right? It's not something that you have to live with day in, day out, the constraints of it and the, the lack of comfort. And now we look at space and space has been a kind of a wild, hardcore camping you know expedition where you're sleeping you know there's no human experience it's extreme it's just for the sake of the engineer and the form and the, the and the function but no one wants to go to space really and live like this what's interesting is that you you have the, all this programmatic schedule like you mentioned that that uh, put these humans into these tin boxes and and have them perform tasks you know but if you talk with astronauts you you, you quickly understand that they've, they've taken every opportunity they could to share a meal, uh, drink a bottle of wine, um, speak about their culture. Um, you know, they, they've taken every possible um, 
space that was left behind by the by the by the pro the big programmatic uh, instances to and they've created society in all of these uh, these little gaps you know that were not covered by the by the the engineering the engineered way of living and it resonates also when you talk about nature because what's what's lacking in space is not humans because we are there and we and we express ourselves as human is actually nature we're living in an entirely artificial environment um, outside of that environment is a nature we cannot really comprehend it's void uh, it's darkness it's crazy temperature so it is nature but not the nature we are um, accustomed to so it's actually interesting that if you force humans into a fully artificial environment, um, they tend not to comply and become a part of the machine like some people would like them to be. I'm not, to, I'm not saying people are evil or, you know, well-intended. I'm just saying if you look at programmatic studies in the, in the 60s or in the 70s for NASA, it was all about how can we, um, how can we make a human fit into a complex machinery uh, being a part of that machinery, you know, and quickly some people raised uh, concerns about sending humans and say, why don't we replace with robots? You know, they are more performing, they don't need food, they don't need... And this, this kind of debate still exists, you know. But what's interesting is that we are continuing to sending humans and we, if you think about it, it's pointless to send humans just to perform tasks that robots will do better. What we are sending humans to do is to express their humanity harvest impressions of space, come back for the masses with a, with a viewpoint on space, you know, and what it can teach us. And talking about the chair and how, how shapes and environment evolves with us and with our ability to dominate the constraints, I think space is a very interesting... We are at a tipping point right here, pretty much where, when, the, when, the chim, when the chimney was invented, like you said, you know, where, we, we, we located the, the, the fireplace is still located when you go camping on the floor. It's still at the center because it, it's what separates you from the darkness of night, you know. So, and in, in space, we are, we are at the tipping point where the fire is about to be located on the wall. We have reached the point where we can create um, the conditions of comfort. And I'm not talking about creating conditions of comfort for... Um, billionaires that will go in low Earth orbit. These individuals actually are crash testing solutions for a much bigger picture. What I'm interested in is that once you create comfort, you don't have to rely on professional astronauts only to do that exploration. The same way Darwin didn't have to rely on sailors to do his exploration. You know? So the sailors were there to run the ship, but then inside you had poets, you had drawers, you had uh, geologists, you had people, uh, na naturologists, I'm not sure if it's called like that in English, but you have biologists, you, know, you had people that were there to study their specific field and that were bringing their own vision and some very creative ones, you know. And what I'm seeing right now when I'm saying we are at a tipping point is that because there is two big drives right now in the space, uh, and very interesting one for many people, but I'm, I'm going to talk about my perspective. Uh, human spaceflight is, is going further than ever through the usual agencies, the, 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 the supranational and the national uh, agencies are going to Mars. And with a, if you look at the big picture, they want to go to Mars and they're going to do a, a pit stop at the moon, basically. They're going to try every system that they need to Mars on the on the Moon surface and uh, and orbits, and on the other direction you have private space flight, which grants individuals that are not professionals uh, an access to space. And in both those fields, what you need is comfort. You need comfort for astronauts, for professional astronauts, to go ever further because if you put people on a tin on a tin can for two years, three years and more with uh, conditions that have never been seen before. You know, you can't, you can't come back if there's a problem. You can't um, get uh, fresh food that is bring over every now and then. You can't 
reach your phones, reach your family through your phone. You can't ask a question and get an immediate response from mission control. So you have a lot of different. Uh, there's a new paradigm of going to Mars that needs astronauts, professional astronauts, to be able to deploy human culture and and to be able to make a society, to be able to rely on their ship and not tend for the ship constantly, to be able to not care about these everyday tasks they do, and to feel in an environment where they are safe, they can fall asleep without taking a pill, uh, they can enjoy a meal and probably prepare a fresh meal with cultivated vegetables, they can have a drink when it's Christmas on Earth and it's been two years they are out of Earth, you know, and they want to have a drink and they want to celebrate or they want to have an anniversary. So all these, all what we used to call these super flu and, and you know, not really necessary, they have become paramount, actually, they have become necessary in that professional astronautic direction. And on the private one, this is exactly the same. You need people that are not been taught for 20 years how to operate a complex machinery to be able to express themselves. You need, you need dancers, you need painters, you need photographs, but you also need geologists, you also need um, pharmaceutical uh, researchers, you need a lot of people that are not trained astronauts to be able to perform in space for a couple of days, a couple of weeks. And, for, and so you need these environments to be welcoming environments. You need these people not to have um, not to be in a, in a position where they cannot express their knowledge and when they cannot... And looking at a couple of decades ahead, I, I'm seeing that we are going to finally harvest the, the true richness of space, you know, because astronauts, they gave us a, an, an immense peak and the most of astronauts I know, they are crazy generous people. They're always happy to talk about their vision, but they all come in a way from the same training process you know they don't they they cannot represent the 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 variety and the and the richness that human that mankind actually has to offer in terms of of cultural diversity and and intelligence actually so we are at this, we are at this tipping point where um where the chair is is, is about to be invented you know it's um you know, if you if you give, if you ask an engineer to create, you know, the future of food, they're gonna try to reduce it to the spill because it's efficient and because it's easy and because it's purely about the function of nourishing your body, right? It's the, they're gonna strip the human experience and really make it about the the, the functionality. And yet food, the reason why it's so popular and the reason why all these shows out there is because food is not just food. It's a human story. It's creativity. It's community. It's hope. It's people coming together. I always have this, this theory. Why is it that food for in Europe and why, the, why in, for immigrant you know, uh, families that come to America or from the rest of the world, why is food so important? It's because... And that's a that's a theory. It's not been proven. But if you come from a history that has that has generations of suffering and tragedies, where things that you had are taken away, if you can find yourself around a table with others and breaking bread, then you have hope, right? In the in the worst of of tragedies, if you can have that community, and then you can have a piece of bread and you can share it, then you have that tomorrow and then you have that hope and that's the fireplace right that is why food is really important so the human story of you know of food is hope community the human story of clothing you know beyond beyond the the protection is self expression it's creativity you know all these things and that's one of the reasons why the vision of the future for me has always been you know or in space has always been like kind of dry and not really inspiring because it was by science fiction engineers that looked at the functionality of where we're going, you know, taking away, taking out the human experience and just creating an environment that is purely functional, but it has no spirit in it, right? Even just for me, Star Trek, everybody's, you know, dressed the same, you know, just a, this spandex thing with just different colors. I'm like, really, is this like, is this the idea of a future? We're all going to be dressed the same thing because 
now we're like all part of a hive of a community. It's so counter what we are working on. And so back to that, that, that second question. So for you, the human story of going to space, and I think this is what we've been discussing, but can you take it a little bit further in of the human story of going to space? Yeah, uh, I'm going to talk again about my, my point of view because uh, everything that you say is really interesting. And when I started my journey into that space field, I was, uh, I was also a bit, uh, not, I wouldn't say angry, but I had something you know, with engineers saying, why do you constantly just solve the problem in the most efficient manner without, um, without asking yourself the two, three extra question. And it, this is also because we live in a world. So before I start, of course, it, space exploration has, is 70, 80 years old. And of course, we, we need to, I mean, hats off to all these engineers that actually thought about uh, everything that's happening right now in space. You know, we, you can't just come around 70 years after and complain that they didn't invent the, it the way or the, the way you, you thought that was, um, you know, they had to fight such constraints and, and, and actually deploy such creativity, even in the works of mathematics and physics and astrophysics and, and rocketry, that um, all these, these people are in a way very creative, you know. But going back to, to, the, um, to when I started this, this journey, um, so I was, I was a bit fed up with the engineer um, um, way of thinking. And it's true that today we can afford to think differently. You know, we, we, we really can. It has been proven in the world of technology, for example, in, in every field that we actually encounter every day. But we have, we live in a society that values um, metrics and equation resolution and logic thinking often much more than creativity. And if you look at how what actually our society rests on at the scale of centuries and not at the scale of um, decades, then it's creativity, you know, it's creative thinking. It's actually going the extra mile in the, the direction nobody has that is going to make a breakthrough, you know. And, and this, is, this is where people that, um, this is where science isn't a closed loop where you, you constantly um, solve the same equation. Otherwise, we would still think that the, the, the sun revolves around the earth. It's, when it's, it's actually all those science people that thought outside of their um, the, 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 the general mindset. And that's why science is actually one of the most creative uh, field that, that can exist, you know. Engineering, on the other way, they tend to uh, tick the box, as I say, or, or close the loop, or, uh, you know, you give them a set of constraints and they will provide you with an answer. And I work a lot with engineers and I admire some of their, um, some of their uh, quality in that, in that ability to resolve problems. And what I do right now, instead of fighting, instead of creating a... a, a a field where there is the designers on one side, they, they only think with a pen and paper, and, and the engineers on the other side, they only think with an Excel spreadsheet. What I do is that I say, what if I give you, in the, your set of constraints, I give you specs, but that are cultural specs. And for example, the, the very, how I started is telling a story about human in space, you know, it's, I started by saying, what if we have to, what if we want to drink a glass of wine in space? You know, glass of wine, if you look at the fluidity, if you look at the mechanical properties of the fluid, you know, every engineer will tell you, you put it in a bag, sealed bag, with a, with a valve, with a straw, and you, and you sip it, you know. And then what's happening is that the same quantity, the volume of liquid will enter your mouth, the same quantity of alcohol will spread in your blood, and you will eliminate at that rate that type of ethanol and this kind of thing. So that's the engineer response. But if you look at wine glasses and their evolution in 2000 years and plus that we have wine glasses, which I studied, you know, from the very beginning, why did we, why did we change material? Why did we go to silverware? Why did we go to glass actually? And why is it elevated? And all these kind of, uh, or why there is a stem. 
And if you look at all these questions, they have very rational question, uh, uh, reasons to be. We, we tend to take things for granted, but if you look with a Darwinist eye at the evolution of shapes, you understand that these shapes have made their way through history and they tell a story of human um, appre apprehension of its uh, territory again. So, a bottle of wine is actually a capsule that um, encapsulates, so a body that encapsulates um, not only a grape variety and um, a terroir, you know, but it actually encapsulates probably the weather of a certain year, um, the sun, the rain that has been on that certain land, uh, the family that has cultivated the grapes and the tradition that have led to that type of cultivation of that type of grapes, you know, and then the, um, the knowledge and the savoir-faire of the, of the winemaker that is, has transformed it to a process, a cultural process that is probably dated 4,000 years back into Syria where the first wine was made, you know, and that evolved. And so suddenly what you have in a bottle of wine is not just a fluid with a certain viscosity and an ethanol rate, you know. It is a story of culture, it is a story of heritage, and it is a story about Earth. And that's my reason why I want to take a glass of wine into space. Not because it's necessary, which I have told you before, but it's also because it's one of the most precious things to bring. It's not, you know, diamond and gold are not going to do you any good when you're on road to Mars. Whereas actually a glass of wine might be the key to solve or to create something that is beyond what you can try to pre-think in a programmatic way. So it's a treasure. And when you look at glasses, you will see that they are actually tools that direct aromas through your nose because 80% of the pleasure you will have from a wine comes from the 600 and plus compo uh, aromatic uh, uh, you know, uh, molecules that you have in it. And that actually it is a product that is made for the nose more than the mouth. You know, So the engineer will give you... Um, a device that allows you to get inebriated, you know, basically to put alcohol in your blood straight. And the designer in this case will try to find a solution through um, cultural specification, you know, the, you need to share the bottle, you can't just have a dosage of, it's not a medication. You need to clean glasses, you need to be able to serve different, you know, you need to share and you need to involve the nose in the way you drink. and. This is the story I'm trying to bring into space, you know, that humans, um, there, is, there is a way where we merge the, the ability of engineers to solve a problem and the creativity that lateral thinker can bring into taking into consideration what actually is the, the, the very experience we live here on Earth and we take for granted, you know, sorry for trying to pick my words, but... It's, it's, it's a difficult concept to say that um, if you have to look closely at these things, you know, and to see that they trace back so many years, centuries, millenaries before us, you know, um, as far as we can look back, you know, we have people drawing on the walls and, and sharing a meal around the fire and dancing and getting dressed uh, in a way that protects them from evil or allows them to celebrate or and 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 wearing makeup you know and and these behaviors they they tell a story of cultural rituals you know and if we forget that story on earth there is no point bringing humans to space but i believe we, we cannot really forget it we can encourage it or discourage it but we even when we discourage it the most it finds a way to express itself I was uh, reminded of two things, the uh, space perspective, the, the capsule was going to go up uh, to the stratosphere with a giant balloon, uh, all the different phases of designs and concepts that they had for the inside, right? At the beginning, they thought there would just be this kind of semi or circle of seats looking out, and then that was it, right? I mean, obviously, you want to be looking out. And through their, their, the work that they, and the research, they realized that that's not how we experience. 
we experience with these little groups. So they divided that circle into these little um, two seats, right? Pods. So now that you have, like, it's a total different experience, focusing more on the human, how do we connect together? Did you ever see the, um, the movie Perfect Sense with Ewan McGregor and uh, Eva Green? I'll send you the link, but it's, uh, I mean, the, the, the backstory or the, the premise of the movie uh, uh, in a few words is you have a cook, it's Ewan McGregor. You have Eva Green, who's a, a, a microbiologist and studies diseases and things like that. And in the world, there is this virus that uh, starts to take over the entire planet. But what it does is that it takes away a sense, one of your senses, and then the entire planet loses a sense and then time passes and then it takes away another sense. So first they will lose the sense of smell and then, and right before you lose the sense of smell, what the sense is associated with, you have this surge of, of an emotion and then you lose the, the, the sense. And what is really interesting is that Ewan McGregor playing the chef in a restaurant, when they lose the sense, right? Life continues for a certain period of time and they have to adapt feeding people. And as they lose the sense, at one point they lose the taste. So food becomes more about crunchiness, texture, uh, like how, how do they evolve and create the human story or the experience of food as we, you know, your environment changes. So when we go to space, you know, food has always been just kind of the, the functionality of it. But if you don't have the capacity to taste as we do here on earth, because the environment, because the, the, the air is different now, maybe it's going to be more about the, the texture, about what happens in the mouth and all these things, which like, I feel like this conversation could basically take five hours, but I do want to get to two. I mean, you've, you've developed, when you were um, um, in school, this glass that is circular and then the, the bottle of the champagne. So take us into these designs and what were you trying to do and, and what, you know, what are you looking to work on next? Yeah, so um, basically my, um, my graduation project, my thesis project was this, was this bottle of wine that was a, that was a toric bottle. And, um, and the idea was um, exactly where I stopped talking about wine is that this is, this is the thinking I developed during my graduation where I said it needs to be designed differently than just with um, function drivers, you know. And so I designed this way to drink wine. Um, and I presented this to Jean-Francois Clairvoy, which I had an opportunity to meet. He's a French astronaut. He's actually a been flying on NASA space shuttle for three mis missions and um, and he said but this is a cool concept and it was it was relying by that time it was it still is actually but it was relying on on I was I'm not an engineer but I was uh, taking away um, concepts that are in use for fuel tanks for satellites you know that how do you get the liquid to flow from one point to another and this is through um, physics properties that I discovered, you know, like the, the capillary tubes and these kind of things. So I was um, harvesting the, this knowledge and, and trying to bring it into a cultural uh, artifact. And he said, this is really interesting. I'm going to fly that on the zero-G flight, you know. So he flew it on the zero-G flight. He tested it. It worked well. It worked enough so that I was mesmerized first because it, I, I thought I would have never accessed this kind of technology and second because it's, it's incredible to see um, um, working on space you constantly project you know you have no way of actually trying like on earth if you, if you design a motorcycle or, or a chair you can always put two planks of wood together and see if you're at the right height and if you're you know you can, you can make a dummy object and verify some of your principles whereas what you design for space will work completely differently. So you have to project yourself into that zero G reality and to try to adapt to all the physics that's happening there and which makes it actually a very fascinating uh, job. And that's why I pursued in that direction. And following that zero G flight and an exhibition that was of my work, 
um, Moom Champagne came to me and said, this is interesting what you do with wine, could you do it with champagne? And with champagne, the cultural um, specs are the same, or more or less. It's more about cheering and celebrating than wine, which is, could be more about um, enjoying and looking at the wine and trying to get a um, taste experience, you know. But they both coexist. But the, the physics is very different, you know, it's a carbonated beverage. And so the bottle that I had developed was toric for a reason, because you needed to drag the liquid, there, there, would, there was a need for having no corners at all, you know. So I started back from the beginning, you know, all again with that cultural uh, input, but I had to, to adapt to, that, to a new set of um, physics constraints, you know. And so we developed a bottle that used the overpressure, actually, instead of being a disadvantage, used the, 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 the dissolved carbonated uh, uh, dioxygen that you have in, uh, in uh, champagne, use it as, as in an aerosol, and that helps to, to exit, to push out the liquid from the bottle when you want to serve it. And we ended up um, actually doing that with a glass blower because back then um, I didn't have access to a lot of um, precise machining. And so I thought with what the tools I had at hand, you know, and I was working with a glass blower and I said, could you do a prototype, then a second one, then a third one. And I flew these for my first uh, zero G flight and we had some great results and the story was on. So, and then we started developing on one hand all these prototypes and all those solutions, and on another hand, how can we, um, you know, harvest that knowledge that we were gathering? So, how designers can work with engineers, work on that that sort of principles? Does it interest um, uh, uh, space agencies, private uh, agencies? And that was uh, so. That was five years ago. And on the journey, I, I had to create a company, try to find a someone that can insure me for this kind of stuff because I'm no engineer and someone that can find uh, that can finance this and and we've been creating an ecosystem where um, designers and engineers work really together now and we have credibility enough of credibility so that engineers you know they just don't say oh you guys you're just about the envelope and the sexiness of things you know we're actually bringing something to the table that is of interest for them for the space agencies also and we work on, uh, basically now we work on what has been regarded as um, bodily functions, nutrition, sleeping, you know, and we try to interrogate these big fields um, with an eye, with a creative eye, and trying to think, okay, um, how we sleep is actually how we um, rest in our intimacy, you know, how we find ourselves alone in a place that is crowded, that is of very little intimacy. So when you sleep is, is a moment where you surrender your body. And so we try to interrogate things differently than just what is the sleeping position and uh, what kind of chemicals you take to sleep because it's no secret that actually a lot of uh, astronauts, you know, they, they, they are so uh, uh, disturbed by the, the end of circadian circles that you have to uh, that you have to get an assist to to fall asleep, and we are thinking, okay, so the place where you sleep is actually the place is has to be a place of your intimacy. You know, you have to be able to find a sense of home there. You know, a sense of a place where you can actually rest, um, not only your body but your mind. You know, in in a in a in an environment of work. You know, the right next door. You know, sometimes there is not even a door. You know, you have you actually just a, a small corner, and you have to settle there. So if, so if you think that like, try to sleep on your workplace for six months, you know, with people wandering around, you know, in an open toilet on a corner, and, and then you think, okay, so this looks more like a jail than a, than a lab, you know. It looks more like a, you share much more than just knowledge with these people, you know, <laughs> with, the, with your co co-livers, you know. So the intimacy, the way you retreat, is what we brought to the problem of sleeping. The same way we're trying to think as... Um, food preparation, you said, food consumption, but also food preparation. Like, What is true is that not only, as you mentioned, there's something that creates when you put humans together, eating together, you know, but there's also something that creates when you cook, you know, when you prepare your food, because it's a way to express creativity, it's a way to 
conquer a territory in a moment, you know, and not conquer in the terms of, of war, but actually it's a, it's a moment where you fuse with your, with your territory, you express something, you know, as a human, you, you, some people paint, some other dance, some do photographics. When you cook, I know that because I am, I cook every day, you know, and I, I, I realized I actually need the cooking to unwind from my day of work, you know, and, it, and that's actually more, the meditative things. And I'm not saying I'm cooking, you know, with Zen music and co very slowly, I'm cooking in a hectic way because I'm on a hurry, I need to feed my kids, you know, but mentally what happens is meditative, you know, it's something that is help you reconquer the time, um, express your creativity, uh, unwind from the stresses of your work. So it has a lot of... So food has, is not... It's, it's a massive topic, but it's not only about consumption. It's also about preparation. And this preparation, these ideas, they actually echo a lot with constraints that you will have on a journey to Mars, you know, where you will have to cultivate your own vegetables and to not rely on, on pre-preparated um, food stock because this doesn't add up. And when you start thinking that we could, because we are starting now, you know, and because we have, uh, we as a as SPADE, the agency that, I, that I've uh, founded and that's mainly uh, composed of designers, I'm, I'm really trying to bring the designer's mind and the way we process uh, the creation of an object and uh, the analysis of an experience into, uh, I'm bringing it uh, high enough in competence so that we have the attention of engineers and programmatics uh, uh, program managers, you know, and we have it right now because this kind of thinking echoes with what they will have to face in two, three, four, five years when they prepare for a journey to Mars in 10, 20 years, you know. And what, what I'm offering right now is that we actually test these solutions in low Earth orbit. We use those platforms, those private platforms, you know, where there is a need for welcoming people in the right way. We use these platforms to develop and to imagine the future of space light, not for the sake of it, not to make luxury hotels uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on orbit, but actually because this is the next key element that we will need to explore further the um it reminded me the uh you know back in the days of the european explore uh, uh, uh migration crossing you know crossing the uh, the ocean like every time that i find myself on the on the cruise ship not the big ones but the small ones but the the the, the, the thought process is, is still the same you know, back in the day, back in the 1500s or 1600s, the conditions in where they would navigate the ocean. I look at these these replicas of these ships, and you're like, how many people were on that? And they were eating, and the the the, the proximity and how like the human experience was like basically misery because of of everything. And now we're either flying or we're navigating, you know, the oceans, and it's. And it's literally just incredible. Yeah, I, think, yeah I, I agree with you. And I think it's even, it's even more incredible if you look at airplanes. You know, if you look at the airplanes 120 years ago, we're not talking about centuries, you know, 120 years ago, airplanes are zero, you know, it's, it's just the beginning, you know. So you have wealthy individuals that were almost all um, crazy, you know crazy enough to risk their lives, to try crossings, to invent. They were all fab manufacturing their planes and flying into them, you know? So you have these crazy individuals. I'm trying to make an analogy with, with, with space right now, you know? Then you have the science and the military that really is for first the military, exactly like in space, you know? So if you, you have the crazy guys, you have the Hermann Orbert, the Tsiolkovsky, the, yeah? And then you have the, then you have the military that took over. So in in, this, in space, obviously, uh, the the drive was with the V1 rockets from the from the Germans, and then and then going into the Cold War, you had that military drive again. Then you have a science platform that, after the two world war, deployed into space, uh, into aircrafts, and into space, pretty much in the 80s, 90s. You know, a bit a bit later after the the fall of the wall. So scientific cooperation, just 50 years after, actually. 
And then you have this, um, you have this, uh, this, what happened in, in planes is that it got slowly available to not everyone, obviously, but to a lot, to, to a lot of people, you know, and that actually traveling in plane right now for modern societies is not something incredible. And what most people say is that traveling in space will be in 50 years, in 100 years, not so crazy, you know. And if you look at the, the progress curve, you know, they, they really add up to that, kind of, uh, to that kind of reasoning. So what we miss, the cornerstone of what we miss, is actually to be able to um, welcome everyday people, you know, basically. And as I said, for me, it adds up because the, the direction we are taking with space which is, I think, uh, let's not forget, we're talking about an incredible driver of progress, not just because we are going to invent stuff to conquer space that we can use on Earth, you know, telemedicine, te uh, I don't know how you say telemedicine, like, um, uh, so healthcare from a distance, basically, like healthcare over, over the phone, you know, or like diagnosis and treatment over the phone or over, over some, some sort of device or, you know, I don't know. A lot of things have been invented for space and that we enjoy today, you know, like this, this AirPods that you have, the, the technology that silencing was invented for the space shuttle because the noise was not uh, sustainable in the space shuttle. So they invented that, that technology there. So obviously there's this, this thing that we all know that it feeds sort of high-tech um, innovations for Earth. But what's interesting is what we don't expect that space is going to bring to us, you know, and how exploration, like it had for the sea and the land and the heights and the, and the depth of oceans, what we, what we learn from the depth of ocean, and we've only explored 4%, is actually a key for understanding the biology of everything, you know, and probably solving, tackling problems that, that have to do, do with climate and that maybe a micro alga is going to bring the solution, you know, probably actually. But um, what we are going to learn in space and, that, and what we don't expect, so the encounters that we are going to do, and I'm not talking about little green men, but the encounters of ourselves and of, of nature that we have never witnessed and of knowledge that cannot yet be apprehended because it's not part of our scope of mind, you know, this is key, actually. This is, this is something we have to pursue because, I mean, the universe is vast and, and Earth is not finite. It's not, it's not um, I don't want to go into philosophical uh, thinking there. It's just typically logical, you know, if you, that's why I want to talk about territories because the surrounding is part of Earth, actually. You know, moon is the moon is a part of Earth. Everyone can understand that. You know, you see the moon every day, or not every day, but every every month you see the moon. You know, with some few exceptions, you see the moon, you see the sun. They are part of Earth. You know, and they have they have been considered part of Earth and orbiting both around Earth for for, for centuries. You know, the science has proved that wrong, but in our general idea of the universe, they are part of Earth, and then the rest is the stars. Maybe they are a bit. You know, on the own. But actually, no, we have to extend that. You know, the galaxy is part of Earth, conceptually, you know. Obviously, we are part of the galaxy, you know, scientifically, but conceptually, we as human, this is our territory, you know. Yeah. I've always said that it would be shame for life to spend billions of years in developing in complexity, right? Uh, starting from a, a, a microbe or little single cell organism and having all this evolution only to be limited on this tiny little speck in the grand scale of the universe right if 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 you're going to involve if you're going to do all this if you're going to spend all this energy in developing well ultimately is because you want to get to a point where you can continue and go beyond and you know and continue with the the life story right the it's 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 we've 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 created a story around something that is in that is about life and nature. Like it constantly wants to go beyond and 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 evolve and adapt and continue. So the humans are about to give that 
that life, its biggest push, you know, maybe since we came down from the trees or we came out of the, the earth, right? We're about to really give it longevity beyond where it started so it can continue to uh, propagate. Octave, we could talk about champagne, we could talk about food, we could talk about anything because it's the design of the human story, like the, we speak the same language. But for the sake of timing, I'm really interested of what would be Octave's, well, I mean, now that you're, you know, you, you've you started, you've done these amazing designs and you have family, you have two kids, you have a business and you're really fully into the, 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 the human experience of what it is to live. What would be Octave's three words of wisdom? Well, I'm going to be uh, probably, uh, people are going to find that I'm on a loop, you know, but I will have to state again that exploration is key and that doesn't, that's not about space, necessarily only about space, you know. For me, I think we disregard too much um, the, the benefits of actually wandering in a field, in a, in a physical or in a mental place you have not been, you know, not looking for anything. And I'm not saying that, you know, you're going to use serendipity to, to, to you know, I'm not, I'm not really into that kind of thing. I'm, ju I'm just saying, wandering, trying, not trying to solve a problem. We are, our day-to-day -day life is about solving problem, you know, and we, we put not enough energy, I think, into just exploring, just seeing where things go, you know, dedicating a bit of time. And if you look at space, actually, most of people think that human in space is the big picture of space exploration. And it's not. It's not even 1% of the budget, you know. It's not even 0.1% of the budget, you know. Most of space exploration or space uses is dedicated to telecoms, surveillance, robotic exploration, uh, you know, satellite imagery and all good things that we use every day, you know, but human exploration uh, is, a, is really the tree that hides the forest, you know, we, it's, 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 it's a fragile program with few individuals, with um, lots of people that really don't see the point, you know, and I, 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 I encourage people to see how exploring can make a difference in their everyday life and how we have to back that kind of human adventure that is actually key, you know, because it's not answering a problem, it's not ticking a box, it's actually opening doors that we don't know where they lead. You know. So exploration is key would be my only statement if I had to make one, you know. Then, I don't know, let's, Probably, let us also not forget in this kind of situation and in every situation, let's try to also not forget where we come from. And I'm saying that for astronauts that are going to go to Mars, but also for all the people making the programs for them, because where we come from is, uh, is obviously Earth, but it's also something we, we tend to disregard, a history. We take things for granted, whereas if you... And I'm very happy you mentioned that chair um, anecdote because it's it's really a great image of how things happen, you know. And they don't happen uh, because they solve a mathematical problem. They happen because they randomly occurred and then they settle because they were um, they were at the right time, at the right place, and they were fulfilling something. They were relevant. No, actually, you know, they are things, and it's Darwin's theory, you know, in, in, in evolution, things happen randomly and they persist because they are relevant. So let's not forget where we come from. And I don't think I have a third word of wisdom. Yeah, maybe, maybe a general word about design, you know. I hope I have, I have um, contributed to make people think that design is not only about the look and feel of things, you know that it is a science of deconstructing experiences, see how they work, see on what sort of shapes, you know, physical but also mental shapes they rest, and that design is, a, is one of the greatest challenges, uh, space is one of the greatest challenges design has ever had to face, because 
we can't rely on principles that were, you know, of balance of weight, of usability, of ergonomics that we have been using on Earth for forever. We have to find a new way for shapes to, to be reliable again, you know. Because if you bring a chair with four feet on space, it's not going to be useful. It's not going to be relevant. But what is relevant is that we use chairs to sit around tables and we do society around tables and we need a place where we are all on the same axis, on the same height, and that we are able to deploy um, society within these conditions, you know. So if we don't bring the chair, we have to bring what the chair is bringing us here. You know? And and that's not only uh, not having a cold butt, it's actually, it's actually really it has the same height pretty much everywhere in 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 modern world because you you have to be at the same height you have to be able to to engage and so um i hope that i i contributed to um to to say something about design you know and about the fact that it's not just sexy objects and it's actually not you know i'm not i'm not into designing couches and chairs i'm i'm really thinking there is a great challenge here in space and that design can really bring something to the table. And that's the, that's the big difference about like becoming like machines and staying humans. I think that design does that, right? The design brings us back from a world turning into machine where everything is just logical and is dry. But design brings that richness that that yeah. design pays attention. Yeah, actually, the um, do you have do you keep a one of your bottles, your your champagne mom bottles in the in the fridge as a as a reminder? I would love to have everyday champagne available at hand, but no, I have a, I have early prototypes actually. You want to see them? Yeah, yeah, quick click. Yeah, definitely. Um, here is a. Here is one of the first prototypes that was hand blown, you know, and um, you have this um, uh, this shape that serves both as retaining the cork and um, also the liquid actually uh, goes there when you when it exits the bottle, and so it gathers here first. It doesn't go everywhere, you know, and then you can actually serve by doing a small. Um, I can send you a video. You 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 will see. You can actually serve the champagne, and it floats around, and then you you you. Just grab it with a specific glass, and you can clean glass, you know. And and this was the service um, mechanism that was located actually on the bottom to mimic an, an ancient gesture of service, actually, and to try to replicate, to, to try to drag into the shape something that that we have learned from servicing champagne on Earth. You know? Amazing. Well, make sure that the um, those videos are in the uh, description or in the uh, accessible through the podcast when you're talking about exploration my own definition of exploration it's a it's a it's not really about the destination but it's more about anyone getting outside of their comfort zone for the the objective of learning something so it's you know a a teacher who is in a nine to five job you know their definition of exploration is stepping out of that nine to five right that their their own definition of comfort zone if they can kind of find the comfort into pushing that so that they can learn something. And that's, and, that, and that's what these, these new frontiers offer is, is through that, that objective of discovery, the technologies that are needed to get to these new places and up, you know, go, you know, helping and elevating everything that's behind and space is just the continuation of that. It's nothing different than everything that we've done before. It's nothing different than the kids leaving the family home so that they can create their new, you know, their, their own lives and, and their own careers and having their own children. And they're all doing it not at the expense of their parents. They're actually doing it for the sake of the family, you know, the, the community, the, the, the wealth of the family. So space is, and if we can bring that story, what you're doing with the design and what Futures Space is, is doing by really kind of reminding people that the science and the technology ultimately are just the background, but not the reason why. I definitely, I actually would love, let's, you know, I'll, I'll publish this episode, but I would love to bring you back so we can, you can kind of explain more of the, 
the, the these designs and 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 take us through the thought process and the human again the human story of these designs that would be wonderful is that yeah, do you want to do that yeah we'd excellent love to. in the meantime i know that's evening for you uh thank you so much that was oh, that would, like like i said designs and the human story for me are two of my most cherished uh topics so i'm, I'm extremely grateful and uh, until the, the next episode uh, take good care and uh, we'll see you soon yeah, thank you very much, Daniel. It was really nice conversation.